Good morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on when you are watching. My name is Dominic Green, and I am blessed to pastor the historic Trinity African Methodist Episcopal Church, located here at the heart of Manning, South Carolina, where we believe that God is our Father, Christ is still in the redemption business, and the Holy Ghost can do something about our situation. Our prayer is that you would connect with our family so that we might become a part of yours. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. To each and every one of you, my father's children, I am just excited about being back after spending a week at the General Conference. I am fired up and ready to go as we continue to press forward toward the annual conference and begin to look even beyond that to see what ministry looks like and what the longevity and the future of our church looks like. Let me begin by saying I am excited to announce that we will be resuming in-person worship services on the first Sunday of August. That is August 1st, I believe, if not uh, credit to my head, but if I am correct, it's August 1st. That first Sunday of August, we're inviting you and the family to come back, join us here in worship. We'll be asking that all persons will be wearing face masks while they are indoors. We'll also be continuing to stream our services as well. So persons will remain connected that way. But we are coming back together physically. We have always been together as a body of Christ because even though we were not in the building, we know we had the church on the inside of each and every one of us. So I just wanna share that I'm excited about coming back. I believe that it is going to be a time of revival and revitalization. And I'm going to be sharing why, because I truly, truly am excited. I would love to say that after going to the general conference, I was encouraged by what I saw. I was not, I will be very public in saying that it was an interesting experience that, I'm, that you were blessed probably to not have attended. However, I want to say because I saw how messed up the general conference was, I am committed that I will never allow Trinity AME Church to be as messed up as the conference was that we attended down there in Florida. As I say that, it sounds very critical. Let me also add, I want to acknowledge that the people, the tech team, our commission chair, did the best they could in the midst of challenging circumstances. And I think sometimes we judge people harshly but there comes a time when we have to call a spade a spade. The general conference was a failure. We had it, it didn't work. We move forward and press forward and we pray to learn from our mistakes as a body of Christ as we continue to move forward. I don't think anyone except for perhaps the candidates and persons who are elected to bishop in the respective general offices are excited about what happened. Everyone left mad and disgruntled and we need to find ways that we are going to continue as a body of Christ to truly embody what was the motto of the General Conference from legacy to mission. In less than 90 seconds, let me tell you what that looks like for us as a body of Christ. When I think of legacy, I think of who we are and I think of our history. I think of who we are being founded in 1865, given land by Major Rigby to build a congregation in the heart of downtown segregated races, Jim and Jane Crow Manning, as black peoples of African descent, the descendants of kings and queens taken from West African and Central African shores to these lands imported in ports like Charleston and Merrill's Inlet to till the lands of cotton, corn, soybeans, indigo, and other cash crops. And God has blessed us. He has taken us from brush harvest to be able to stand in edifices like these where we're able to worship, have jobs, and even occupy some of the highest offices in the land and continue to break ceilings and barriers. First, we elected a person of color to occupy 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and now we have elected the first female vice president of the United States. I always say that she's the first female vice president of the United States. She just so happens to be black, not to minimize her blackness, but I am so excited. She is a sorrow, a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and an HBCU graduate which means good things can come out of Morris, Benedict, Claflin, SC State, and our other schools. So we give God the glory for what God has continued to do. That's our legacy. Our mission is to serve the present age with a calling to fulfill, which is to preach the gospel in season and out of season, going ye therefore, making disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
And I'll be the first to tell you, it's been a minute since we baptized people at Trinity. It's been a minute since we've received a new members class, and it's not acceptable. We have to have a renewed zeal towards evangelism. We have to have a fervor that begins on the inside of us when we change the narrative from negativity and dying to a narrative of new possibilities. I believe that God can do a new thing, not just at Trinity, but in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And you do too, because if you did not believe that, you would have stopped coming a long time ago. You would have stopped investing your funds. And what I am asking is, as we move forward into this new quadrennial, is that you continue to first put God first. Because the word says, if we seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, all these other things will be added unto us. Second, after we have put God first, sought him diligently in prayer, and discern what God would have us to do, I am asking that we commit ourselves to the work of kingdom building. Many of us, and myself included, have been lukewarm for whatever reason. God says in another, I'd rather you be hot or be cold. Because if you are hot, I know what to do with you. If you are cold, I know what to do with you. But we have this wishy-washy spirituality where we have committed to church, we'll come, but we don't tithe. We'll give our money, but don't show up. We need you to be committed if we are going to tackle the challenges of the next four years. And lastly, after you have put God first, and second, after you have committed yourself, I am asking you, my father's children, you know at least five people that are not connected with the body of Christ. And I am going to invite you to invite those people to connect with you and the missions project that I am asking every member of Trinity AME Church to get involved in. You might be thinking, what is the missions project that I'm doing, let alone the missions project I can invite somebody else to? Glad you asked. I'll be calling every member of this church in the next two weeks talking about how we can be missionaries as a body of Christ. The status quo cannot remain. And after the hot mess I saw at the 51st session of the General Conference, we will not be the church that lets what happens in Orlando happen to us. People might get mad that I seem negative and, oh, I'm talking so bad. I'm just keeping it 100. I am sick and tired of hearing the negative story of death and dying. I am sick and tired of hearing how our tradition is killing us. There is nothing wrong with the tradition of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. There may be a problem with the manifestation of African Methodism where certain people are, but this is the church of Richard Allen. This is the church that funeralized the first African American elected to the Senate, Hiram Rebels and Blanche K. Bruce. This is the church that elected Reverend e. Ransom and catalyzed the social gospel in places like Chicago. This is the church that housed people like Madam C.J. Walker and others. This is the church that helped provide shelter to Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass when they needed pulpits to preach in. This is the church that welcomed Dr. King to Metropolitan and Mother Bethel and Mother Emmanuel. This is that church and it's here at Trinity that I am rededicating my life and I'm calling upon each and every one of you to rededicate yourself to myth up the kingdom of God. Our best days are ahead of us. And with your help, we are going to help make that a reality. To God be the glory. Um, before I go any further, let me per usual thank the tech team for the amazing things that they do under the leadership of Sister LaSondra Walker. To Minister Stephanie Castle, who on last week shared with us a dynamic message as she continues her studies at Duke University School of Divinity. Supporting the future of ministry has to be something that we continue to do. Also to those who may not have paid their tithes and offerings, now is a great time. If you go on the GiveLify app or download the church's Tithely app, you can do that right there or go to our website and click on the donate button. I'm truly excited. I'm fired up. Sometimes, you know, people talk about how negative experiences can fire you. If I had, a, I didn't have the best general conference, but I saw from that a need and I saw from that a sense of call and vocation that I refuse to allow Trinity to be as messed up as what I saw down there. To God be the glory, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book recorded by the prophet Samuel. Second Samuel chapter number two, beginning at verse number one. 
Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. First, excuse me, Second Samuel, chapter number seven, commencing at verse number one. I'll be reading from the New International Version, which is our tradition here at Trinity. Your version might be slightly different. However, as long as it lifts up the name of Jesus, it is all right with me. There you will find these words written by the prophet Samuel. Second Samuel, chapter number seven. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. That night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord says, Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty said. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be the ruler of my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people. I will also give you rest from your enemies. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the good news of the gospel is that the word of our God shall stand forever. I encourage you to read the chapter and the subsequent one It's in its entirety. But for the brief time we had together, I want to talk about rebuilding God's house. Rebuilding God's house. Let us pray. Hide me now, O oh God, behind Calvary's old rugged cross, so that the people might not see the mess that is dominated great, but allow them to see the God that is crucified in Christ Jesus, high and lifted up and with your train filling this temple. I'm trusting you now, God, for preaching. I've seen you work in others. Now, God, I'm asking that you might work in me. Do it again, God, so that thy name might be glorified, thy people might be edified, and the devil might be horrified. Lord, it's in you that I'm trusting. Have thine own way. It will be ever so mindful and ever so careful to give your name the praise, the honor, and the glory. And all God's children together say, Amen and Amen. My brothers and sisters, I believe that God has given us a clarion call. First and foremost, we're called to honor thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind, for this is the first commandment, and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. After all, it's Jesus who says, upon these two laws hang all the commandments and the prophets. There's a good AME out there who knows that that is the Decalogue and our first responsibility as a believer and member of the body of Christ. But if I can push it a little further, yes, that's our first calling. But from that calling of putting God first, because when we seek ye first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, all other things are added to us. Seeking God puts us in a place where we're able to hear clearly from heaven what God might want us to do in order to serve this present age. I find myself on a mission perhaps like Mordecai when he went to his niece Esther saying that perhaps Trinity, perhaps Manning, South Carolina, perhaps members of the AME Communion or the Baptist Church or the Church of God in Christ or our neighbors at Manning UMC, Manning Prayers or First Baptist across the street. I believe that God has called all of us 
to the kingdom for such a time as this. There is too much going on in our society for us to keep on going on as if everything is hunky-dory, that everything and everybody is doing fine because when we survey the landscape of time and in our present moment, we will find that there are some hurting people in our midst, that there are some broken things in our community, and I would even argue that there are some children getting ready to start school in a few weeks that if truth be told are behind because of the pandemic and how virtual education did not meet some of their needs. It's not to knock the school district. It's not to play the efforts of what hardworking teachers and administrators did, but it's just to be real with ourselves. Our children are in danger, and it's time that we stand up. I invite you to the text written by Samuel in 2 Samuel chapter 7, because here what we find is David is in a place where God has brought him to this victorious state. He has not only overcome Goliath, put down rebellions and defeated the Philistines, he's like many of us owning his own home, blessed to have a job, has food on his table, clothes on his back. David is so blessed. He's a worshiper. Remember, he told McCall that he was willing to act even more undignified than this. David is a tiger. David goes to church. David has a prayer life. And David is trying to raise up his children in the way that they should go. So when they grow old, they shall not go astray. Matter of fact, it's because of who David is and more so who God is to David that David has a dream in the midst of him going about his saved and sanctified life filled with God's power. And he realizes despite all the good things that have been happening to me, I cannot ignore some of the other things that are going on around me. And one of the things that David realizes I'm in the word is that I'm in this blessed state while the tabernacle of God, God's dwelling place, is in disrepair and I cannot allow this to continue. Have you ever stopped by and realized that you might be successful and you might be blessed while others in your community are struggling? Have you ever taken the time to realize that yes, your children might be able to read on grade level, complete their homework and know their time table, but your nieces and nephews or your cousin's child isn't on the same level? Have you taken the time to realize that one of your co-workers is maybe struggling while you're on the verge of a promotion? Have you ever taken the time to stop and realize that perhaps I'm in a blessed state so I can be a blessing to somebody other than myself? Why? Because God did not bring you where you are so you can bask in your own glory. God brought you where you are so you can reach back down and hit somebody else. In our text, we find David has a revelation stemming from his relationship with God. My brothers and sisters, I will not question whether or not you were saved. You know the status of your soul salvation. If not, come to Jesus while you have time. But if you call yourself saved and know your name has been changed to redeem, you must realize that there is a crumbling institution in our community, that there are hurt people in our community, and we're not using our skill set to help restore people's lives. One of those institutions David realizes is, God, is God's house. He realizes that God's house is in disrepair while he lives in luxury. Text lets us know in verses 3 and 4 that the Ark of the Covenant, the place where the Ten Commandments, the rod and the ephod are the place where the Spirit dwells between the cherubims, the very presence and embodiment of God is in disrepair while he lives in luxury. My brothers and sisters, if we were to look at the state of the church in America, I would argue that many of our churches, Trinity included, are in a state of disrepair. We've been out the buildings for so long that when it's time to clean the church, we find it all kinds of problems leaving the church in a state of disrepair. Now, we're not just talking about the spiritual disrepair, but I'm talking about 
We got mold in places that we didn't even know existed. We got trash in places that we didn't know were there, that we have found ourselves in a physical place where the physical building is in disrepair. We bought homes, but the church is in disrepair. We've got promotions on our job, and the church is in disrepair. We've been blessed in our finances, and the church is in disrepair. Our child has received scholarships, and the church is in disrepair. God kept your child through this pandemic. You never got sick through this pandemic, but the church is in disrepair. And not only are we in a physical state of disrepair, if truth be told, when we look at our spiritual status, we would find that our spiritual status collectively is in disrepair because many of our individual spiritual states are in disrepair. What do you mean, preacher? Not tithing is called disrepair. Not loving your neighbor is called disrepair. Not praying and fasting is called disrepair. Not allowing your body to consume any and everything is called disrepair. Not reading your Bible is called disrepair. Not checking on others is called disrepair. Holding grudges is called disrepair. Not being at Bible study is called disrepair. We're so disrepaired and tore up, we need a mechanic in the house. And from this revelation, of recognizing that the place where God is is non optimal in David's eyes. David, as a saved individual, says, I've got to do something about it. I can't dwell in luxury while my God sits in a tent. He gets the dream. He says he's going to build something bigger. He goes to the man of God. The man of God says, David, your vision is good. It's good that you're able to recognize that you're in one place when it seems like others may be in a different place. I'm glad that you want to share the wealth. And what I love is Nathan gives him the go-ahead, which is a reminder that your motives and your intentions are good. But Nathan himself has a revelation. Nathan tells us in verses 5 through 9 that after he goes and sojourns with God for a little while, he has to go back to David and his response in the first 11 verses is that David when have I ever questioned the dwelling place where I was I have been with you everywhere you go now you have to understand the story from David's perspective David wants to do something that is glorifying to God David is associating God's presence with a particular place and yes, we should honor and reverence the place and not allow things to fall into disrepair. But Nathan's response I think is appropriate for the virtual church on today because God is saying, yes, I understand and appreciate what you want to do, but I don't need to be in a building in order for me to have power preach Dominique Gray because my presence can transcend the walls of churches. My presence is able to transcend the boundaries that you want to impose on me. My presence is able to go out and fish for lost souls at the lake. It's able to go out and save souls by Walmart. It's able to go out and save somebody at school that I don't need a building. I'll be everywhere I need to be. And for those of us who have said they don't feel like a virtual church is for them, for those of us for who have for so long not wanted to be engaged because the church don't look like what it used to be when we're not sitting in these red pews, I came by to let you know, God said I'm not a God just of a particular tabernacle and place. For years, when you moved, I moved. For years, when I sent you to that job, I went there. For years, when your child went to first grade, I went to first grade. When your child went to second grade, I went to second grade. When your baby started high school, I found myself a monarch too. Why? Because I can be everywhere. And I would argue, my brothers and sisters, that Nathan's reminder to David in his words that God is able to be everywhere is not a negation of the importance that David realizes when the church is in this. Repair. I'm in the book. Please pray you didn't close your Bibles. What happens is 
Nathan lets David know that you cannot limit me to a particular place. You cannot confine me. I don't need you to build anything for me. However, I will appreciate anything that you give me. See, there's some of us who feel that we're so essential to the church, church can't survive without us. There's some of us who feel that if you were not the president of the missionary society, or if you're not the one singing that song on the choir, the church gonna stop functioning because of you. But God is letting us know your desire to want to do something for me is good, but I'm willing to be anywhere. And in the subsequent verses that we dipped and lift up, God does not tell David not to build the temple. God says, prepare the resources so the temple could be built, which is an affirmation that yes, you are called to restore the temple, but I need you in this season to get this one thing straight. I need you to take my church into the streets. Why? Because people my age that are millennials are not possibly beating down the walls to come to church. People who are hurting might feel uncomfortable walking in the 51, no, let me be real, 39 West Rigby Street. There are people out there who might not step foot in this sanctuary until first they experience the church in their homes, until first they experience the church in your car, until first they experience the love of Christ in you. The love of Christ in you can transform a soul now before they get to this church. We shouldn't forsake the assembling of the righteous. We're not saying the church can make it without you. But I need you to start serving God where you are. Why? Because that's what Jesus does. Jesus didn't have a ministry limited just say his hometown in Nazareth. Jesus doesn't have a ministry that began on Palm Sunday when he finally arrived on the stage of the authorities in Jerusalem. Jesus' ministry was in all Cappadocia. Jesus' ministry was on both sides of the lake of Genesaret. Jesus had a ministry on the land and that sea. Why? Because God knew that if he could preach on the land, then he would need to be able to preach on the sea. Preach, Dominique Gray. That if he can preach in the church, then you might need to have to start preaching on your job. If you can preach on the cell phone, then perhaps you can start preaching on Twitter. That if you can Facebook and Snapchat this, then you can dance and TikTok for the Lord. Why? Because God is calling that each of us give him his best and for far too long, we've been giving God a lukewarm response, a half-hearted approach, and little to nothing in terms of our time, talent, and treasure. And God is saying, enough is enough. It is time to come home. And as we prepare to open up the doors of this church again, and we prepare to unite back as a body of Christ, don't come back in here with the same attitude that you had in March 22, 2020. Don't come back in here with the same negative mindset that you had when standing ushering. Don't, don't, don't come back in here arguing about what song gonna be singing at choir rehearsal. Don't, 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 don't come back in here talking about I'm not gonna show up if it's Children's Sunday. I need you to come back here with a mind to work and serve. Why? Because God is calling us to rebuild his church. There is a charge to keep we have. And a God to glorify the other dying soul to save. And fitted for the sky my calling to fulfill. To serve this present age. My brothers and sisters, perhaps you've heard today's message. You know what God has done for you. You find yourself recognizing that God has called you to do more. You call yourself a believer, but you know you've only given God your 10%. When God is saying, yes, I know 10 is the tap, but I'm asking that you would give me everything. You can't give your boot 10% of your heart. 
Can I keep it real? I ain't never met a person that was half in love. You either gave God everything or you gave God nothing. You either was in the relationship all the time or you wasn't with him none of the time. You cannot be half saved. You cannot be half in. You cannot be a member of 20 different churches. You got to find a place for your own soul. And I want to invite you to consider this messed up place we call Trinity. It's a hot mess. I know that because I go here and you know that because you do too. And just between me and you, that's enough to cause everybody to pause and say, Lord, do I really want to go to that church? But here's the thing though. If I can admit that I'm a mess and you can admit that you're a mess too, the messes that want to walk in these doors, perfect people don't go to church. People who need help and need God come. And when they see us reaching towards God from the midst of our own brokenness, they'll come running with open arms saying, here I am, Lord, willing and available to be used by you. Message us. Send us something in the Facebook chat. We want to connect with you. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I believe it is the best decision you will ever make in your life. I know somebody thinks that sleeping with such and such was a good decision. That might be true, but it was not the best decision. I know you think marrying your loved one was the best thing, but it, I'm telling you something about Jesus that can do something for your soul. It'll change your family. It'll change your job. If you will only let him in your heart. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.